matter of considerable importance. A Safe Haven Orphanage Mystery by Patricia Acedevega. Episode 2. It had been hilarious to see Kachi put his hand into the left pocket of his trousers, then the right one, and then look at the girl with his mouth open, unable to say anything. For the rest of the day, Nicholas's friend was in a far mood. He was not one to accept hunger pangs with grace. He kept repeating, I know I had the money during the first period. Second period. Then he would frown, not able to account for the rest of the time. Nicola slowly, reluctantly, started the walk back home. Going back without his stuff was another opportunity for Uche to ask him about them. And why wouldn't he? Knowing how much he had needed and pined for the set. There was a lot of noise in the school car park. He could hear adult voices scolding or speaking and children talking to each other. Ordinarily, he would have paused and listened. He sometimes wondered what it would be like to have a parent pick him up and ask how his day had been or if he was hungry and wanted something from the canteen. Sometimes he daydreamed about how it would be to have a life like his classmates. Would he have been happier? Small but mighty was the only one who had the privilege of a mother visiting him in school multiple times, though never for a good reason. But the teachers and principal of the boys' school knew her well, something he sensed the woman would have been happy to do without. Hands in pockets, he continued dragging his feet as he lamented his fate. The one new thing that he had managed to own, and he had not been able to keep it for more than two days. He felt someone walking next to him and frowned, wondering why the person did not walk past. It wasn't in the way. Glancing sideways, he saw it was Chinenye. The girl was staring at him in a strange way. I see. Like me, nobody's here to pick you up, she said. And he did not reply, as he did not consider the statement to need an answer. Look, if you want, I can help you with the investigation you started, the girl offered. I don't think you'll get your stuff back. But it's worth a try, and frankly speaking, after observing your methods, I feel almost obligated to extend my services. This surprised him, and for a second, he had expected the same level of interest he saw her put into everything that wasn't the precious book she was reading, which was none. I just have no idea where to go from here, he said. I can't confront everyone. I had thought of staying back tomorrow from break and taking a good look again, but then I thought that if my set wasn't discovered when the teacher searched the class, even with the advantage of the owners giving him complete access, then what use is it taking another look? Of course, I made it easy for the thief, since I'm the only student in class whose desk doesn't have a padlock. Till now, this wasn't an issue. The worst that happened was that Abiodun and his cronies had access to my homework. I've never caught them, but I know they take my stuff, and they know I know. It didn't help matters either that I wrote my name on sticky tape. Now I wish I'd listened to my brother and used the tip of the compass to carve my initials at least. How could I have been so? No need to beat yourself up about it now. That's no solution at this point, Chinengye said. For what it's worth, the said probably wasn't in the classroom when Mr. Wale went from desk to desk. You said he asked those present to take everything out of their backpacks. So we have to agree that the thief was one step ahead of you and predicted that you'd speak to the teacher. Anyone would have made a fuss. It was a brand new geometry set. Nick's heart sank at the ever-present thought of his loss. Then an idea came into his mind. You didn't tell us who you saw taking Kachi's money. Maybe it's the same person. Who was it? He asked his classmate. The girl shook her head. I can't say anything at this stage of the investigation. One can go around rambling without proof, but we need to come up with some suspects. Can you remember who exactly was at the game with you? Who would benefit from the loss? I mean, aside from the person who needed a new set. One down that, and we'll talk about it tomorrow at break. I'm going left here. Bye. They had arrived at a junction, and with a wave, the girl walked away, leaving Nick pensive as he walked in the opposite direction. He set the table mechanically and barely noticed that stewed beans was on the menu that day. He hated beans with a passion.
I have to be grateful for small mercies, he thought, as he stacked the plates up to take them to the kitchen. Sixteen-year-old Helen was in charge of serving them at mealtimes when their mother was in home, and Nick always asked her to serve him a smaller portion of beans when Gloria or Lotu was not at the table, except for when they were lucky enough to get fried plantain with the beans. Then he did not make the signal to her to serve him less in case she did not interpret him properly. On occasion, he had even counted with her to make sure no mistakes were made with the pieces of plantain they each got. Move along, move along, move along. I don't have all day. Small but mighty was wearing an oversized apron and making hand gestures to his siblings in charge of clearing up, hurrying them up, sponging hand. He looked like he was directing traffic on a very busy road. Nicholas had forgotten that his punishment was to start that day. He had expected to have found him in a foul mood. But to his surprise, the boy was not scowling. He bombarded the washing up master with questions. How did the meeting go? Were you called to testify? Did Mama scold you again? You should have seen Mama. She put all of them in their place. Ha! She just gave it to them, left, right, and center. By the time she'd finished with them, nobody was smiling except me. In secret, of course, they called us out from the class. And when we got to the principal's office, Tamsley's parents and Mama were there. He was asked to give his version, and before he could even start, his mother jumped up and told the principal she had to expel me. What? Nicholas asked in shock. He had expected problems, but not the request of a direct expulsion. Small but mighty nodded. Wet sponge in hand, as all he had managed to do so far was to add soap to the water, his attention on the narrative that he was accompanying with a lot of gesticulations and theatrics. I was shocked. I just thought, this woman wants to kill me. If she succeeds in getting me expelled, I'll be washing plates till I leave this house, which I've calculated will be when I'm in my mid-thirties. My brother, I started sweating, even though the air conditioning in the principal's office was switched on. You know, the note was from my teacher. Well, I thought she'd be the one to settle the matter, but Tamsley's parents have connections so we were sent directly to Mrs. Wonsu. What did Mama say? Nicholas asked as he tried to imagine the scene. She was quiet. That scared me even more. Then Tamslin began his narrative, and it was as if he was talking about a completely different event. He said he was just passing by. Then out of nowhere, I just went for him, grabbed his shirt, insulted him, and that he didn't even try to defend himself. He even turned to his mother and said, just like you've told us, violence doesn't solve anything. I opened my mouth in shock. Then his mother repeated again that I had to be expelled and that her son wasn't safe going to a school with someone that evidently had no home training. She said I was wild. Can you imagine? Like I was some sort of animal. I started defending myself and oh, things weren't looking good for me, especially as the father reminded the principal that they always paid all their dues on time. And something about donations. I saw myself being sentenced without a just trial. Then Mama stood up. Ha! You should have seen her. You know what I'm talking about? When she slowly looks at you from top to bottom. Nicholas nodded. It was that look that made whichever child was in trouble know that she had seen through his or her story but would allow the perpetrator to continue talking to see how far the individual was willing to go. Those quick enough to catch the look quickly desisted, not wishing to sink deeper. The woman had been right. They did not need a TV in that house. Turning around, he saw that the rest of his siblings had gathered to listen to the story. Small but mighty, finish the story quickly, Helen urged him. I told Mama I would go and help her in the shop after I finished supervising you all. She mentioned your name in particular. She sat down on a stool as her brother faced his audience once more. Mama asked him then if he was alone when it happened. The silly boy said no, and he mentioned the names of three or four boys that were present. So Mama requested they be summoned to collaborate his account. It was almost comical to watch. 
the way they all contradicted themselves. Even the principal shook her head in dismay at one point. Then Samuel, one of the boys, said, All Tamslim did was call him worthless, and Henry just went for him. At that point, Mama looked at the parents. They had no idea that they were up against the world's top interrogator. The principal then said that regardless of what had taken place, I had torn the shirt and the parents were asking that it be replaced. Then Mama said, I know my son. And Tamsley's mom cut her off and said, He's not your son. None of those children you have in your house are your children. And just look at how they've turned out. Nothing good can come out of that place you call a home. I then noticed Mama's left leg was tapping the floor very quickly. Next thing, she got up. What did she say? Nine-year-old Albert blurted, his eyes open with curiosity. She pointed at both parents who were looking at her and said, I don't blame Tamslin for what he said. I blame you. She was angry. And the other woman wisely kept quiet. She said, He's become a bully and sees nothing wrong with telling another human being that he is worthless, simply based on the circumstances of his birth. He is my son, as are the 13 other children living in my house. You don't have to give birth to be a mother. Madam, of the two children, which of them do you think deserves to be expelled? You promised that Henry would be treated the same as the other students in this school that he would in no way be made to feel different. After seeing what just happened, in which you did not even ask him if he had any witness to stand for him or to hear his side of the story, do you think this is a fair situation or that he was treated the same way as this other boy? Is it because we have not always managed to pay the school fees on time or made substantial donations to the running of this institution? Shame on all of you. Then, with one last look at them, she walked out. Me? I didn't even know what to do, until I heard a shout, Henry, from the hall, and I ran after her. I left them looking at each other. They didn't even understand what had just happened. Me? I'm glad they didn't insist we pay for the shirt. If not, my punishment would have doubled. Now, please, everyone, leave. I have work to do, except Nick. We have business to discuss. He shooed them away with his hands, and Nicholas laughed. Small but mighty had the makings of a great actor. I just wanted to inform you, knowing you probably say no, that for a small sum, I can get you another geometry set. A small sum? Where am I supposed to get it? And where exactly would the set come from? Nicholas asked in surprise. This had been the last proposition he had been expecting to receive. Don't ask what you don't want to know the answer to, small but mighty replied, finally turning around and starting the washing up. Yes, Richie told me about a similar scheme in his school. Apparently, there's someone that can get you any school materials you need. Kachi explained to Chineye and Nicholas after the latter had told him about the offer his brother had made. He said once he had to spend all his snack money on a pen because he forgot it the day of the exam. He ended up paying even more for it than he would have in a shop. Something about the law of demand and supply, he said. So maybe my things were sold to someone outside the class. I will never recover them, Nicholas lamented. I've just listened to a very boring second-by-second -second commentary of the football match you both played in, Chineye said. Honestly, Kachi, if you don't end up becoming an engineer, something I very much doubt will happen, you should consider offering your services as a presenter to a sports channel. So whilst you were both reminiscing about the match you lost, I wrote down the names of the students who were accounted for. Stephen, Gerald. Kunle and Babatunde were on the field with you, so that rules them out. Abiodun, I have written with a question mark. Chinenye looked over the notes she had been taking as the boys had recounted the match to her. Why? I distinctly remember him shouting insults at me when Ahmed dribbled me, and after the match, he looked for me to tell me one or two things. 
If it wasn't for Nick, there would have been a fight. Kachi frowned at the unpleasant memory. Did you notice him all through the match, or just when he insulted you? I mean, I want to think that the match wasn't lost because you were paying close attention to the spectators, was the girl's reply. The more time I spend in your presence, the more I understand why the other girls aren't in a stampede to get you to go out with them when the bell rings, Kachi blotted out with a look of disgust. Of every three words you say, one of them is an insult. You would win the Miss Sympathy contest, hands down. Hold on, Kachi. I understand what she's saying. You only remember Abiodun because you had an altercation with him. But other than that, you wouldn't have been able to account for him. What if he did this on purpose? You know, like in case he was asked to produce an alibi. Nicholas asked excitedly, going over quickly to the boy in question's desk with the intention of opening it. Sadly, there was a padlock in place. His face fell as he returned to the other two. I have looked, and you really are the only one in our class who doesn't have a padlock. Why is that? Chineye asked him. You ask a lot of impertinent questions. Why do you think he doesn't have one? Kachi asked, evidently still smarting from the way the girl had spoken to him. She shrugged and wrote something down. So, I have shared out the tasks we need to do for now. Nick, you need to find a way to search the desks of the people who don't take technical drawing and were present during the first search. Also, see what you can find out about Deborah. Kachi, find out who the illicit provider of materials in school is. They might have one and it could help the investigations. At worst, you might be able to get one at a better price. Why me? Kachi looked at her suspiciously. Of us three, you have more possibilities of knowing such people. But when you find out, don't go charging like a bull and asking questions. I know you, but we must act wisely. Come to us and tell us what you discover, and we will decide what step to take next. Those boys are normally not the kind that occupy the front spaces in class and sit quietly listening to the teacher. They can be rough and dangerous. And what will you be doing in the meantime? Nicholas quickly asked, seeing that Kachi was about to lose it and wanting to avoid any more arguments between the two. It felt like neither of them understood the meaning of the words friendly banter. I will be thinking, who do you think is the brains behind this operation? The smug-looking girl replied. At that point, Nicholas took a step back. There was nothing he could do to prevent the volcano that was about to erupt. As he walked away, he could hear them comparing test results. He shook his head, not understanding why his friend did not see the trap that had been laid out for him and had, as suspected, fallen into it. The math teacher had even made a comment out loud about his last assignment as she was handing it back to him, advising him to stop and reason before giving an answer. Nicholas sat down at his desk, looking around as he tried to devise a plan to search the desks of the students who had not been present the first time, knowing their owners would have to grant him access for such a search. Chin Ye had taken the easiest job for herself. He had no idea what she had to think about, but he was not going to waste time doing as she had suggested. If he was caught snooping around his classmate's property, he would get into trouble. No, he would investigate in a different way. Keep his eyes open and ask questions. Someone was bound to think himself or herself too clever and make a mistake, and there he would be to seize the moment. He looked up at the sound of an argument. Deborah had gone over to Viano's desk. She was standing, and the class prefect was sitting down. They were both tall and big, but that was where the similarities between them ended. The boy was mild-mannered but she could be quite loud when she felt the need to voice an opinion, which was quite often. The teacher from the previous period had not been present, and so the class had been rowdy, interrupting the one next door that was being taught by Mrs. Umoto. The teacher had come in angrily and asked the class prefect to write the names of the noisemakers and offenders. From where Nick was sitting, he could see that the boy's lips were moving, 
but he could not hear what was being said. She, on the other hand, was being listened to loud and clear, whether one wanted to or not. I dare you to write my name twice on that stupid list, and then I double dare you to submit it. Should I be punished and have to stay after school, I will pay you back. It might not be today or tomorrow, but you will suffer for it. So, if you want to start sleeping with one eye open, write my name twice. Go on. Letting out a hiss, she turned around and walked away as Nicholas noted the ashed eyebrow of Chinenye at the back of the class. She nodded, indicating what he was to do. I'd rather fail the exam than go and interrogate Deborah, he said to Kachi, who let out a chuckle at the fright on his face. Were you able to replace the materials you lost? Nicholas turned in the direction of the voice speaking to him. Rita, who sat a few seats behind him, was observing him and waiting for an answer as she pushed her glasses back. Tall and skinny, she was one of the pupils who their English teacher, Mrs. Adeshina, frequently said would go far. When she looked at one of them with pride as she uttered those words, Nicholas often wondered where the rest of them were destined to go. I didn't lose it. It was stolen, he retorted, offended. She got up from her desk, a white plastic bag in hand. Either way, I don't think you would get it back since it didn't turn up in that first search. Look, the exams are fast approaching and I have brought you this. It's not complete or in the best condition, but it's better than nothing. Nick had expected anything but that. He looked inside the bag at the rulers covered in scratches and felt really grateful. The exams had been worrying him. Technical drawing was not the only subject in which the rulers would help him. Maybe instead of looking for what he had lost, he needed to concentrate on getting a decent geometry set together. He smiled at the girl, often called four eyes by some classmates, and put them in his desk, hoping that the old materials would not draw the attention of the thief. Rita was one of the few girls who had chosen the subject and was quite good at it. Considering that he was a strong academic rival of hers, her gesture was even more appreciated. Thanks a million. Did you by any chance see any suspicious activity that day? He asked hopefully. No. For the last two weeks, I've been spending my breaks in the music room. We are preparing to give a recital in the prize-giving ceremony at the end of the year. Mr. Adipo makes use of every second we have, and we have to practically run into class when the bell rings. On the day your stuff was stolen, you were all in class when I came in. I was able to slip in through the back door when you were all standing to greet the teacher. Agnes came running in with me as well, so that clears her. He nodded, crestfallen. Nothing was ever that easy. He just had to continue searching. I don't understand all the fuss. They stole your set, so the answer is very simple. Still another one back. Nick and Rita both looked at Charlie, who had been passing by and invited himself into the conversation. Charlie, that's stealing. Rita exclaimed in shock. Uh-huh. Were you the first to steal? The boy asked. You'd only been using the intellect you were blessed with to solve a problem with the means available to you. Let me give you an example so you get my point. At the beginning of the school year, my father buys all our school materials, and he tells us that he will only be replacing pens and pencils. So if anything gets lost or stolen, you steal someone else's? Leaving that person to go home to explain things to his or her parents, Nicholas managed to utter in shock. Their mother would make them return anything that wasn't theirs. She even kept tabs on the stuff they borrowed. She often said that they could be branded poor, but should never be called dishonest. The only thing they were ever to feel ashamed of was falling into the second category. Charlie shrugged unconcerned for the fate of his past and future victims. As long as I don't have to be the one doing the explaining to my father. Did you take Nick's set? Rita beat Nicholas to the question he had been wondering how to formulate, 
though in a less direct and a more delicate way. Of course not. I give you permission to search my desk, was the magnanimous reply the boy gave. Nick proceeded to do so and found nothing there. To be fair, he had not expected to, showed that the offer had been made with the assurance that nothing incriminating would be found. Come and search mine too. Turning around, Nick was met with a scornful smile of Abiodun. He knew better than to accept his invitation, show that some form of public disgrace would follow. The biggest boy in their class was flanked by two members of his entourage, Bode and Arthur, as he approached them. See, you need to stop disturbing the class with your little problem and move on. Take it from me, you will never recover your stuff. You actually deserve what happened to you, making us lose the match that way, and me a good sum of money in the process. I couldn't have come up with a more fitting punishment. Let's see you try to get more than 40% in the exam now. So we lost the match because of me? Was I the only player on the field? Nicholas asked defensively, taking his reply as an open invitation to clarify what happened from his point of view. Abiodun put his arm around Nicholas's shoulder and proceeded to give him a painful, detailed account of how the match went from bad to worse each time Nick touched the ball as his two cronies added any details Abiodun had missed out. One thing that Nick became abundantly clear on during the conversation was that the class bully, and at least those two of his friends, had been present for the entire duration of the football match. And you, come here. Let me explain what the role of a defender is, because you seem to think that it's dancing around like a chicken any time you receive a tiny kick. Abiondu motioned a boy called Kunle to approach. The boy's face reflected his great reluctance to receive a lecture from him. Luckily, the teacher walked in at that precise moment, and Nicholas saw Abiodun's mouth to be continued to Kunle. Nicholas shook his head. It was just a game. So as he felt about losing, why did Abiodun have to gamble and take things to another level? He looked down at his list of suspects, written in pencil, and crossed out three names. To stay up to date with Patricia Acedevega's work, make sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking on the subscribe button and hit the bell for notifications. Mm -hmm.